My Weekly Milk Welcome to My Weekly Milk, where one can be fed with the milk of the Word of God, be stirred up in the Spirit and endued with spiritual strength to face the challenges one might encounter during the week and come out victorious. One can pass on or forward this My Weekly Milk to as many people as he thinks it might bless. The Bible has the final authority. Therefore, brethren, whatever you read in this letter, be like the Christians of Berea, who went back and checked in the Scriptures if it was so. This My Weekly Milk is presented to you by M.M. M. Jerry, but everybody calls me G. Topic, the Power of Confession Many born-again Christians, when they hear the word confession, do not have the full revelation of what God means. We will not try to present an exhaustive study of the subject, but a succinct and clear one, with some practical examples. Below is our main scripture reading. Romans 10, verse 6 to 10, and then from 16 and 17. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or, Who shall descend into the deep or abyss? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Chapter 1. What is Confession? In the Bible we find the Greek word homologio, which is a combination of two Greek words homu, at the same place, at the same time, having a close association, together or togetherness, and logos, something said, something thought, communication, speech, frame, works. So, confession is saying the same thing God and His Word are saying for a particular situation, thinking the same thing God and His Word are thinking about a particular situation, having the same frame of mind that Christ has. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 5 it is doing the same work Jesus is doing. It is being at the same place where God instructed us to be. It is being one with God. What he says is what we say. What he does is what we do. Where he goes is where we go. As born-again Christians, our life is a life of confession, whether we have realized it or not. We have been confessing. Let us apply that confession in specific areas. Let us start with the area of sin. Chapter 2 Confession of our Sins Many times in a church setting, we do not talk about sin in the life of the believers. It is as if only when you are unsaved you have sins, but when you are born again you no longer have sins. So sin becomes a taboo among Christians because if one admits he is struggling with a sin or an addiction, he is afraid that other believers will think he is not spiritual enough. The truth is, many Christians are struggling with sin and they keep it to themselves. Church is the last place you can find help for your sin since everybody looks so holy and self-righteous. The church in Corinth has all the gifts of the Spirit, but they were struggling with sin. Paul had to write to them to rebuke them openly. In the first epistle of John, he addresses the issue of sin in the life of the believers. Both Paul's epistle to Corinth and John's first epistle were addressed to believers, not to unsaved people. If only we stop pretending and admit 
that sin is sometimes rampant in our pews, we will be able to help the brethren like Paul and John did. The first thing that every born-again believer must know is that God can deal with our sins, no matter how big we think they are or how numerous they might be. When Adam and his wife Eve sinned, our father God dealt with their sin problem by killing an animal and clothing them with its skin. Today, you and our brethren have the perfect Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus, who was slain for my sins and your sins. Our sins, trespasses and iniquities, though they might appear to be many, Jesus bore them on the cross. Why do I have to confess my sins? Chapter 2, 1 None of the persons of the Godhead are trying to condemn anyone for their sins, but convict each one of us of our sins. God so loved us that he gave his only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins, that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16 God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but to convict it. John 3 verse 17 Jesus never condemned the Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews, but his words convicted them. But instead of confessing their sins, they walked away from Jesus. The solution for their sin. John 8 verse 9 to 11 Jesus told us that when the Spirit of God has come, he will convict people of sin. John 16 verse 8 People condemn themselves when they reject the provision for sin that God made by the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross. Condemnation is never of God, neither of Jesus nor of the Holy Spirit, but of the devil and of the Pharisees, self-righteous people who think they are better than others. They were the ones trying to stone the woman caught in adultery in John 8. Jesus said something very powerful about the Pharisees who go about condemning people. They do and speak what they have seen with their father, the devil. But he, Jesus, speaks what he has seen with his father, God. John 8, verse 38 to 44. Jesus convicted people, for it was what the Father taught him. But the Pharisees condemned people and wanted to kill them, just like their father, the devil. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1 From the very moment Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from the presence of God. God delights in fellowshipping or communing with his children. He came into the garden to commune with Adam and Eve, but they hid themselves and were ashamed. Genesis 3 verse 7 to 9 God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knew that Adam and Eve had sinned, but he still came to fellowship with them. Satan knows that when we sin we will run away from God because our conscience is now accusing us toward God. Romans 2 verse 15 God is always running towards us, even when we sin. He was running towards the prodigal son who was coming back home, kissed him and fell on his neck. Luke 15 verse 20 He was the one coming to Adam and Eve after they had sinned. God is a great Father. The only thing He wants from us when we sin is to take responsibility or ownership for our own mistakes. He is like the Father who knows that his five-year-old boy took something forbidden or broke a vase in the house. The Father just wants the boy to say, I did it, Daddy, and I am sorry, I will never do it again. Please forgive me. Adam and Eve did not take ownership of their mistakes, nor were they sorry for what they did. Instead, Eve blamed the serpent, Satan. Adam blamed the woman whom God gave him. In a way, he was blaming God too. 
If you had not given me this woman, I would not have disobeyed you. Genesis 3, 12 to 14. But the prodigal son was sorry and remorseful. He truly repented and decided to go back to his father. Luke 15, verse 17 to 20. We see that the prodigal son was restored to the fellowship. The father received him home, forgave him, kissed him, and then restored his inheritance and authority. But Adam and Eve, who, after being convicted, did not repent nor take ownership of their mistakes, were driven out of the Garden of Eden and did not enjoy the same fellowship they used to have with God. John told the church in his first epistle that sin would affect their fellowship with God. He wanted them to stop sinning so that they would enjoy the same fellowship the apostles were having with the three persons of the Godhead. 1 John 1 verse 3 John told them, Do not run away from God when you sin, but instead run to Him. Do not be like Adam and Eve, but like the prodigal son. Even if your heart is condemning you, do not listen to your heart. It is Satan speaking to you. God does not condemn you, but convicts you. Even if your conscience is accusing you that you do not deserve the forgiveness of God, do not listen to your conscience. God is greater than your heart that is condemning you, and greater than your conscience that is accusing you. 1 John 3, verse 20 to 21. Let us put our confidence in God that he can handle our sins. John then tells us, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9 If we say the same thing God is saying concerning sin, then he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The prodigal son confessed, said the same things or had the same thoughts about sins. He knows what he did was bad in the eyes of his father, and he said, I have sinned against you, my father. God is so good. He wants us to keep enjoying a great fellowship with him. That is why he gave us the blood of Jesus to remove sin, the guilt and the condemnation that comes with it. Chapter 2-2 two, two, The Power of the Blood Over Sin No matter how innumerable our sins were, though they are like scarlet, the blood of Jesus will make them as white as snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18 David, who was a man after God's own heart, sinned when he went with Bathsheba. Instead of confessing his sins, he tried to cover it up and ended up murdering Uriah, her husband. 2 Samuel 11 When we try to cover our sins like Adam and Eve covered their nakedness with leaves, we end up being disciplined by our Heavenly Father. David also was disciplined by God when he covered his adultery, which had escalated into a murder. 2 Samuel 12 David, being a king, with all the wealth of Israel, knew he could not bribe God. God was not after gifts and sacrifices, but after the confession of David. Therefore, when David confessed his sin, he said, You do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite heart, a deeply affected heart with grief and sorrow for having offended God. These, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, 16-17 David acknowledged that he had sinned against God and had done evil in his sight. Psalm 51 verse 3 to 4 It took David time, but at least he came to his senses like the prodigal son did and confessed or saw sin in the same light God saw it. That sin was evil and what he did was not right. The blood of Jesus covered the sins of David after he had confessed and repented. David could gladly say that as far as the east is from the west, so far the Lord has removed his transgressions from him. 
Psalm 103 verse 12. The blood of Jesus has the power to wipe out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Colossians 2 verse 14. In other words, David under the Old Testament was supposed to be put to death for committing adultery and for murder, but when he confessed, the blood of Jesus wiped out all those edicts that were sentencing him to the death penalty. God will never mention those sins to David again because they are no longer in the record book in heaven. God wiped them out by the blood of Jesus. Furthermore, the blood of Jesus will cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9 verse 14 God told us that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul, or cleanses your soul. Leviticus 17 verse 11 Jesus said to us that his flesh was meat indeed and his blood was drink indeed. John 6 verse 55 Jesus is our Lamb of God slain on the altar of the cross to make atonement for our souls or to cleanse our souls. The spirit of the flesh is in the blood. The spirit of Jesus is in his blood. Therefore, the blood of Jesus does not merely forgive and cleanse our souls from their sins, but the Spirit of Jesus comes upon us to empower us to stop sinning. The Spirit of Jesus, who is in His blood, empowers us to cleanse our conscience from dead works. If we used to steal, we no longer have the desire to steal, for stealing is a dead work. If we used to revel, we revel no more, for reveling is the dead work. If you used to commit sexual immoralities, we do them no more, because the spirit that is in the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from those dead works. Jesus says adultery begins in the heart. Matthew 5 verse 28 Jesus was not telling us that to condemn us, but to convict us and let us know that there is power in his blood, to even cleanse our conscience from all our lustful thoughts, for they are dead works, works of the flesh. The blood of Jesus through the spirit of Jesus that is in the blood will even remove all condemnation, all guilt. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, was also our scapegoat. The word in Hebrew is azazel, which means entire removal. Jesus took away all our sins and iniquities. The azazel was supposed to take away all iniquities, all sins and all transgressions of the people. The word iniquity in Hebrew is avon, which means guilt, perversity and punishment or condemnation. Leviticus 16 verse 20 to 28 Jesus took away our guilt and condemnation, so when we are in Christ there is no condemnation or guilt because of our past life. Jesus, our Zazel, took away our avon. John the Baptist could point to Jesus and say to the people, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29 The people in those days understood what John the Baptist was saying. He was saying, This is your scapegoat. Not only will he entirely remove all your sins, trespasses and iniquity, but furthermore, he will also take away the guilt and condemnation out of your hearts and conscience. That is why Paul, though he was among the people who killed Stephen and persecuted the church, Acts 7, when he was converted to Christianity, he could boldly say, I have wronged no one. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2 does it mean that we do not feel any remorse about the people we wronged in our unsaved life? Not at all. Paul, even when he became born again, would let people know the kind of person he was, how he persecuted the church, how he was sorry for what he did in his unsaved life. But he would not allow anybody to condemn him or put guilt in his heart. He knew it was by the grace of God that he was saved, and not of his works, for his works were evil. But the blood of Jesus qualified him to be a son of God. 
God wants to remove even the footprint of Satan in our life. Many times we have confessed our sins and we know that God has forgiven us and cleansed us of all unrighteousness. But we are still struggling with some thoughts and sometimes we are still being tempted to commit the same sin. Satan has his foot propping the door of our heart. He is looking for an opportunity to enter into our life again. The footprint of his unfruitful works of darkness is still in us, but confession and the power of the blood of Jesus will not only erase his footprint in our life, but also remove his foot from propping the door of our heart, shutting the door permanently to that sin. We will be able to say like Jesus, the prince of this world is coming, Satan, but he has found nothing that was his in me. John 14 verse 30 let us evict Satan and all that is his. Erase his footprints from our life. Chapter 2-3 Exposing the Works of Darkness in Us Paul told the Ephesians to have no fellowship with or be partakers of the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them and reprove them. Ephesians 5 verse 11 The devil is the prince of darkness. Jesus is the Prince of Light. Anything that is done in the dark that one is ashamed to tell everybody is of the devil. The way to overcome it is to expose them, to put them out in the open. It loses its power. In our main scripture we have read that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, then we will be saved. Many times we have repented in our closets. We have talked to the Lord and we know according to the scriptures that he forgave us and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. But we are still struggling with some unfruitful thoughts, some lusts and some addictions. Many times when people are born again, they are still struggling with lust of the flesh or pornography or alcohol addiction or drug addiction etc. They have confessed in their closets, they have pleaded the blood of Jesus, and they have confessed the scriptures, but they still go back to their old habits. They are afraid to say it to the church, lest people think that they are not true Christians. The Bible says that we must confess our trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that we may be healed. James 5 verse 16 what has hindered the confession of sins to one another is a confidentiality issue in churches. People have had bad experiences. They confided in the brother or sister and the next thing they knew, the whole church was gossiping about their personal issue. This lack of confidentiality has hindered the work of the Spirit to free people from their struggles, addictions and eternal battles with their lusts. People of God are supposed to pray for those who struggle, not gossip about their struggles. The solution is to find a person whom you know will never disclose your secrets, but will help you and check on you to see if you are still struggling with that issue. The moment we expose or confess what our struggles are to a close person who is a mature believer, it breaks the power of Satan, for the light has been shed in that area of darkness in our life. The brother or sister will also ask us to confess that struggle or sin to God and will pray with you. The important part is the prayer. Why? The power of agreement, one of you shall chase a thousand, but two of you shall put ten thousand to flight, because now the Lord, the rock of your salvation, has shut up the enemy that was whispering those lustful thoughts into your mind and heart. Your rock has surrendered your enemy that's been defeating you in that area of your weakness. The Lord, your rock, has stopped the furtherance of the plans of the enemy in your life. Deuteronomy 32 verse 30 Exposing the unfruitful works of darkness in public helps other believers too. They will know that if God helped us in our struggles, God can help them too. That is why the Bible is full of people we can relate to. They made big mistakes in life, poor judgments and decisions. They even denied Jesus and doubted him. 
God put those examples in the Bible, not because he did not forgive them and cleanse their sins, he did it to expose the unfruitful works of darkness in them, so that when you and I read the Bible, we can relate to Abraham, to Jacob, to David, to Peter, Thomas, etc. We can be encouraged that if God turned the lives of them around, he can turn my life around too. There is hope for me. Paul understood the power of exposing the works of darkness that used to be in him in order to help some believers who had the same background he had. People who had persecuted the church, even killed believers, he was telling them, Look at me. I once was like you. I did the same thing. If God can save me, he can save you as well. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet or fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Galatians 1 verse 13 For you have heard of my conversation or conduct in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted or destroyed it. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10 but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. John tells us that we overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Revelation 12 verse 11. We have already talked about the power of the blood of Jesus over sin and our sinful nature, but John, who received that revelation of Jesus Christ, is telling us to add our testimony to the blood of Jesus. This can be applied in the area of sin. By exposing the sins or the addictions one used to battle with, it breaks the power of Satan in that person's life and also in the life of others who are hearing the testimony of how God delivered him from all those sins and addictions. The word testimony John uses in this scripture means the words recorded in the Bible by his holy prophets. In Hebrews it means that God recorded in the Bible, he will duplicate or repeat them in our life. Now we understand why God placed all those testimonies in the Bible. It was to tell us that what he did for David, Abraham, Jacob, Paul, Peter, Thomas, etc., he will do it for me as well. And whenever we give our testimony to expose the works of darkness, let us point people to what the Word of God said. For Peter tells us the only testimony that will never fail is the one recorded in the Bible. God will duplicate them in the lives of the people. Peter calls that the prophecy of Scripture, which did not come by the will of men, but God himself approved them, and he will duplicate them in the lives of his people. 2 Peter 1, verse 20 to 21. There is one danger that we must avoid. The person we are confessing our sins or trespasses to has no power to forgive our sins or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. People will misinterpret the saying of Jesus, If you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John 20 verse 23 Some so-called men of God will interpret that scripture as Jesus giving them the power to forgive the sins of other people or to retain their sins. Thus, those so-called men of God will ask you to recite a number of times a prayer to do penance before they can forgive you. This is not scriptural. The disciples never did that. Jesus bore the punishment for our sins on the cross. Doing penance is not of God. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but that wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual and devilish. James 3 verse 15 It is a self-imposed religion, false humility and asceticism. There is no power in those penances against the craving or indulgence of the flesh. Colossians 2 verse 23 Then what does Jesus mean in that John 20 verse 23? I am glad you asked. 
Jesus gave each one of us the mandate to go into all the nations and preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. If people repent toward God and put their faith toward Jesus, they will be saved. Acts 20 verse 21 We tell them that their sins have been forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. But if they do not repent toward God, nor put their faith in Jesus, we tell them the truth. Jesus is the way to heaven and is the only solution for sin. If they do not have Jesus, they do not have the Father either, and their sins remain with them, because only the blood of Jesus can cleanse them of their sins. For the Bible says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned or doomed. Mark 16 verse 16 the Jews had that understanding that only God can forgive sins. Man cannot forgive sin. If any man pretends to be the one who is forgiving people's sins, he blasphemes. Luke 5 verse 21 And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus could and can forgive sins because he is God. But you and I are men. Though the Spirit of God is in us, we are men, not God. When James was talking about confessing our sins to one another, he was not saying that the other person is the power to forgive you. No, it was to confess what we have done wrong to that person or to another person or to God. When we are struggling with secret sins, sins which are not in the open, we need to expose them to break their power over our lives. Paul will tell Timothy, some men's sins are open beforehand or clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. They commit notorious sins that everybody knows it is sin, but those of some men follow later. No one knows that they were struggling with that sin. It was in their heart, and because they did not overcome it, it led them to commit it in the open, so they suffered the same judgment with the first set of men. 1 Timothy 5 verse 24 Whenever a person can open up to a mature believer what his struggles are, the burden is lifted. And when the two of them pray that prayer of agreement, the yoke of that sin or lust is removed from the person's shoulders and destroyed. Again I will emphasize, look for a mature believer who will not gossip but pray with you, who will not try to use the information you shared in your times of weakness against you in the future to manipulate you or to blackmail you both financially and emotionally. The best thing to do is to ask God to direct your steps to the right person. He will help you. During the Azusa Street Revival, the Holy Spirit was giving words of knowledge publicly even about ministers of the gospel as you can read in the book Winds of God. In one instance, there was a revival meeting in Texas. The Lord started to speak in tongues during the service through one of the ministers leading the service. And on the front row sat two young ministers who had traveled from afar to come and join the revival meeting in Texas. The Lord asked the two young ministers who sat in the front to stand up. They hesitated to do so, but as the leading minister called them by name, Though they were total strangers to him, they knew it was the Lord asking them to stand up, and they obeyed. So the Lord spoke through the minister, leading the service to the first young minister. The Lord exposed that the young minister who came from the northern part of USA had purchased a railway ticket to come to the revival meeting in Texas. The ticket he purchased did not include dining car nor meals. He could enjoy the dining car and the meals if he had purchased a higher priced ticket. The young minister was aware of it, yet he made his way into that dining car and ate the meals. The Holy Spirit said to him publicly, I told you what you are doing is wrong, yet you went ahead and did it. I want you to ask for forgiveness. 
To the second young minister, the Holy Spirit said publicly, You boarded the train and eluded the conductor, and had travelled 350 miles without paying your fare at all. And the Holy Spirit says, I do not approve of stealing from a corporation any more than from an individual. The two young ministers repented of their sins. If you are proud, you will refuse correction, even public correction, from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit exposed their works of darkness, not to humiliate them, but to set them free.